thank you very much for this kind introduction. And um, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to give this lecture here. It's a great pleasure. So I'm going to talk um, about biophysics of cells, uh, in particular, the spatial organization of cells and the role of condensation and phase separation um, in the spatial organization of, of biochemistry in cells. I'd like to first acknowledge um, many collaborators and co-workers. So in Dresden, we have a close collaboration and a joint research program between two Max Planck Institutes. And we have built a center for systems biology, which serves as the hub for our interactions between um, experiment and theory, physics, computer science, and biology. And um, we have been uh, interacting on phase separation in cells for a long time with a um, group of Tony Hyman. I'd also like to acknowledge um, collaborations with Christoph Sechner's group and Stefan Grill's group and many um, colleagues and the two Max Planck Institutes. Um, cells have a very interesting, rich and complex spatial organization. They have to um, organize chemical processes, biochemistry um, in space. And so the, the classic picture is that there are many organelles which have specific purposes and provide distinct uh, chemical compartments and environments in the cell. And these compartments are separated by, by membranes. Now, there are also many um, chemical compartments that are, that are not separated uh, by membranes. Um, many, some of them have been known for a long time, particularly the nucleus. Um, um, some of them um, have highlighted their attention only recently and have been sort of um, discovered more recently. Um, and these are assemblies of many molecules and proteins in small punctal-like structures um, that are compartments that are not bound by a membrane and um, where the physics of phase coexistence and phase um, separation will, will play a role. So this is the outline of this talk. I want to first give an introduction in protein condensates um, as a general theme, and then talk about liquid-liquid phase separation, in particular in the context of cells. I will discuss examples of where the uh, physical, physics of phase separation plays a role in um, cell biological processes, um, such as um, positioning of, of um, objects and buffering of fluctuations. I will then talk a bit about chemically active droplets, sort of droplets uh, in which chemical processes drive them away from thermal equilibrium. And I will um, end the talk with a brief discussion on material properties of condensed liquid-like um, uh, proteins in, in condensates. So um, here are some examples of membraneless cellular compartments, which I briefly alluded to. Um, they can be observed by labeling specific molecular components, for example, by a fluorescent label. And they um, can be found um, in puncta or in, in, in objects inside the cell that are localized compartments, which, in which certain components assemble at high density. Um, some of these membraneless compartments have been known for a long time in the cell nucleus, such as the nucleoli and Cajal bodies, also PML bodies and nuclear bodies, but such structures also exist in the cytoplasm. And I showed some examples here below, P granules and stress granules, for example. And they typically are um, objects in which certain types of proteins um, assemble in, at high density and often together with RNA. Um, so these are often RNA protein condensates that have certain um, role as, as little organelles in the cell and um, carry certain types of biochemistry. Now I will talk a bit about P granules here shown uh, as these green dots in the cell below, um, which we have been working on for quite some time. Um, they are found in the C. elegans embryo um, and in the C. elegans um, worm. Um, so they are examples of protein RNA condensates. They contain many different RNA binding proteins and they also contain RNA. And they are implicated 
in the specification of the germ line and germ cells in the warm C elegans. So this is schematically shown here. So the upper image shows um, a fertilized egg of this nematode worm. Um, and this fertilized egg will start dividing um, and finally form, form a worm. And all the germ cells of this adult worm and also the precursors of the germ line all contain these so-called pregranules. And initially they are provided in the, in the fertilized egg. And whenever a cell division occurs that is asymmetric and only one of the daughter cells is a precursor of the germ line, they will partition into this um, particular cell. So they will be distributed asymmetrically during um, such an asymmetric division process, which gives rise to two different daughter cells. And here I can show you this um, process. We, we have a, one single protein fluorescently labeled, which is a component of these peak granules. You see therefore these many objects of different sizes floating in the cell. And prior to cell division, these objects segregate to one side of the cell. And as the cell divides, only one daughter cell will um, have these P granules while the other daughter cells um, does not. And this means this material is distributed unequally during cell division. Now, um, this seg segregation process uh, can be observed in, in more detail. One finds that these structures, they assemble and disassemble and the um, segregation towards one side of the cell occurs by an assembly gradient. So if they assemble here on the posterior right side of the cell and they disassemble on the left side and therefore there's a net transport of material to one side of the cell. So we have structures, objects that are dynamic. They come in different sizes. They can grow and shrink, assemble and disassemble. And if one watches them under the microscope, by again looking at the labeled molecule with a fluorescent um, tag, one can observe them. And here you see, for example, two peak granules which touch and then undergo a fusion event. And so have two little spherical objects and they uh, fuse into one, which then approaches more a sphere. So they are deformable. They, they behave like, uh, not like solid objects, but rather like, like liquid objects. Here on the right-hand side, we see an adult, um, animal warm um, with cell nuclei on the surface of which these peak granules have assembled. And they look like droplets coating or wetting the surface of this cell nucleus. And if the, the whole structure is sheared or compressed, then the deformations are those of a liquid-like material. So the idea is we have these condensates which are dynamic and have liquid-like material properties. And we can think of them as droplets inside the cell cytoplasm that coexist with the remaining cytoplasm and contain a different composition of material. So this raises the idea that these structures are essentially a result of a demixing process of the many component cytoplasm and that certain components preferentially group together and form a liquid phase that coexists with the outside, similar to liquid-liquid phase separation that we would know, for example, from oil-water mixtures, where we have two liquid phases that, that, that demix and coexist. And such systems in general uh, will be subject um, to temperature ch changes and um, is, the behavior would depend on temperature. In general, you would expect that at high temperature, mixing entropy may win and at lower temperature interaction energies may win and we, we think of a phase diagram of the type shown here where we have a composition axis and the temperature axis and at sufficiently low temperature um, there can be a range of composition where the system demixes in coexisting phases and this could be droplets inside an um, outside um, solution and um, if we go to very low composition on this axis, we would have a mixed phase with enriched in one type of molecules. And if we go to the other end, we would have a mixed phase enriched in the other type of molecule in between the SD mixing and, and phase coexistence. Now in this case, we would expect that for high temperatures, um, we would also get a mixed state. And we can test these basic ideas 
um, experimentally by looking at the system I just described by looking at such a um, cell, uh, fertilized um, egg cell of this form under the microscope and change the temperature. So again, here, P granules are labeled fluorescently and we start at 15 degrees centigrade and we decrease the temperature to 27 degrees in the upper movie, while in the lower movie, we have a control with constant temperature. And um, increasing the temperature actually leads to a dissolution of these st structures. They disappear and this process is reversible. So we can lower the temperature again and this puncta will recondense and reform. So um, this has the phenomen phenomenology of a, a phase separation process that is temperature dependent and gives rise to um, mixing at high temperatures. One can quantify these properties by measuring concentrations inside these droplets, objects, these pea granules and outside um, using fluorescence intensities as a function of temperature. So here you see such a plot, the temperature axis and the concentration axis. Um, this is the concentration of the labeled component and the data points on the low concentration side correspond to the concentration outside of droplets and the high concentration is the concentration inside the droplets. These are the coexisting concentrations and we can think of a phase diagram um, of this type that, that corresponds to these data points and one can capture um, such a phase diagram with simplified um, models for, for example, polymeric phase separation, such, such as a Flory Huggins model. Now this raises the question of um, why thermal equilibrium type of phase separation arguments um, can be used and applied inside a living cell, even though we of course know that cells are far from equilibrium structures. Um, and there are many non-equilibrium and active processes driving um, chemistry, moving things around in the cell, creating structures and so on. So let's discuss a little bit um, um, the conditions in the cell and to what extent and in what conditions we can make thermodynamic arguments when we study cellular processes. Um, so let's have a look, for example, at um, active processes which may release heat and generate temperature changes and temperature fluctuations in a cell. Um, so we can um, characterize the dynamics of temperature um, by an equation that has essentially a diffusion equation with a source term, where the source term comes from heat sources that could, for example, be chemical reactions that dissipate heat in the, in, in the fluid. Alpha is a thermal diffusivity, it has units of a diffusion coefficient um, and the heat together with the specific heat of, of the material, which I would assume to be similar to water, then translates um, heat into temperature changes. Now, um, order of magnitude wise, the, the medium of a cell of, of, a, of, of an organism typically um, involves heat production by active processes and metabolic processes of the order of um, um, one kilowatt per cube meters cube of material. I can translate this down to the scale of a cell that makes about one picowatt or the orders of picowatts for cells. And we can now, for example, look at chemical processes that take place in a cell um, and look at an ATP hydrolysis event, which for example, would release 10 kBT um, in, a, in a local molecular event by changing a chemical bond. And this will release 10 kT worth of heat in the fluid and introduce a temperature perturbation. Now one can estimate with this um, logic how such a temperature perturbation would behave. After a very short time of about 100 picoseconds, it would spread over about one nanometer size and would lead to temperature increase of three Kelvin. If we wait a bit longer, it takes about 10 nanoseconds and it would spread over 10 nanometer distance. And because the energy is just distributed in volume, this reduces sort of the density of energy by a factor of thousand and we only have three millikelvin left. And if you go further, let's say one microsecond, 
then this if would have spread over about 100, 100 nanometers in space and the temperature change um, would be down to three micro Kelvins. So essentially very, very small. So this argument shows that if we look at processes that are slower than microseconds, and if we look, let's say at volume elements in the cell of a size of 100 nanometers, let's say a cube with 100 nanometer box size, then beyond microsecond time scale, we can think of them as a local equilibrium structures where the temperature is well defined and where we can define thermodynamic potentials. And then the non-equilibrium features, they emerge at larger scales at longer times. Um, and then can, for example, be described by reaction diffusion processes and others. So locally in these small volume elements, we can define free energies and we can use thermodynamic arguments and then use thermodynamics and irreversible thermodynamics to, to define the dynamics um, of such systems. And phase separation is now related to free energy functions as a function of composition, which have such features as shown in this diagram, um, where we can have the coexistence of two different phases with different composition where chemical potentials are the same, where the pressure is the same. And from there we can uh, obtain phase diagrams which define locally coexisting phases at constant chemical potentials. If we have droplets, there is a small modification to this very simple picture. Um, we have to take into account the surface tension um, of the interface of the coexisting phases. And then this, this contract construction uh, is modified by the fact that there's a pressure difference now given by the Laplace pressure, um, which depends on surface tension and droplets radius. Now, um, the equilibrium phase separation of proteins can also be studied outside of the cell. We can purify proteins that inside the cell are found to condense in, in P granules or in other uh, cellular condensates, and then look at them um, outside of the cell in buffer solution. And here you see a P granule protein um, forming droplet-like condensates in physiological buffer solution. So these droplets have a higher density than the surrounding fluid, and therefore they sediment down and then form this liquid, protein liquid on the bottom. Here you see another emulsion of the same material, and you see that the classical physics of um, ripening of an emulsion. Now here, of course, since we are outside of a cell, this is a pure passive system. We don't have to worry about non-equilibrium um, driven by chemistry. We just have a process of relaxation towards the thermodynamic equilibrium. And this is governed um, by ripening of the emulsion. So the, where the droplets become larger, and there are two reasons that they become larger. One is that they fuse when they meet and then two small droplets become a bigger droplet. But there's also a process called Oswald ripening um, where material diffuses from small to large droplets. And small droplets shrink at the expense of larger droplets. And this has to do um, with um, a gradient of chemical potential which is generated by um, the effects of surface tension. And, and the difference in Laplace pressure of small and, and large droplets. Here you see an example of a theoretical calculation of a so-called Hakan Hilliard model of phase separation, which takes the dynamics of coarsening into account and shows this Oswald ripening process. Explicitly, you see the small droplets shrinking and the large droplets growing. Just a few words about droplet fusion. Um, droplet fusion is also dr driven by surface tension. Um, the um, droplets which touch can reduce their free energy by um, turning into a spherical shape. And um, this is also generated by pressure difference due to Laplace pressures, surface tension. And here we have, so we have hydrodynamic flows. Um, so this also depends on viscosity. And we have flow fields that drive um, and non-spherical structure towards a sphere. Um, 
the ra uh, ratio of viscosity and surface tension uh, defines the velocity and the characteristic time scale of fusion is this uh, ratio eta over gamma times the size um, of, of, the, of the droplet. And we can use it also to estimate um, uh, uh, surface tensions and viscosities. For example, studying in the cell, the fusion of two P granules, uh, one finds that the, the relaxation time for this process correlates with the size of the objects, the slope, of this plot is then a measure of the ratio of viscosity to surface tension, which in this case is of the order of micrometers per second. And um, if one has an estimate of the viscosity of the solution, one gets a surface tension, which is very small, only 10 to the minus six newtons per meter. And I will come back to that at the end of my talk. So let me talk a little bit um, now about how these physics of droplets is used to uh, segregate and position material in the cell, in particular in the context of the segregation of P granules towards the posterior end of this dividing cell. And let me first mention that this whole process, which segregates P granules towards the posterior side, is organized by cell polarity. So the whole cell division process is, is um, happening in a cell that is structurally polarized and asymmetric, and the division gives rise to a different composition of the membrane um, of the two daughter cells and different composition of the cytoplasm, the two daughter cells. So they, and this is organized by uh, membrane domains. Uh, so you see two different types of proteins are enriched to different regions of the membrane. This polarization near the cell membrane and the so-called cell, cell cortex organizes asymmetries um, in the cell cytoplasm and then gives rise to this asymmetry of cell division. The daughter cells will have different sizes, will have different composition, as I mentioned before. And so the first point is that the asymmetry in the cell membrane is used to set up concentration gradients um, in the cell, such as the concentration of the protein X5, which is enriched on the interior side and falls down towards the posterior. And this such concentration gradients are then um, organizing the segregation of the P granules during the vision towards one side of the cell by position dependent assembly disassembly kinetics. Um, so here's a, this idea, we have a gradient of concentration and by this concentration is small, um, P granules tend to condense and by this concentration is high, uh, P granules tend to dissolve. This is in fact a quantification of this concentration gradient of max five together with the positioning of the P granules. Now, Putting this into a picture of phase separation, um, one can think of MAX5 being a component which influences the phase separation um, process of P granules. So we have now a multi-component phase diagram. One axis here is the composition um, in terms of the, the material that forms P granules and the high density, this is, would be the inside of the P granule, this would be the outside of the P granule. And here we have a phase separation. And this phase separation now depends on the concentration of another component, um, for example, X5. And the idea now is that the system um, um, at, at the different ends of the cell because of the gradient of MAX5 can, can locally correspond to conditions um, um, where the two ends of the cell are in different uh, um, regions of the phase diagram, the mixed region or in the phase separated region. And so the locally we can use thermodynamic arguments, but globally the system is out of equilibrium as, as um, clarified by the existence of concentration gradients, but locally we can, we can use um, um, sort of an argument based on a phase diagram to clarify whether components mix or demix. Now, this is a simplified picture. Um, the, the reality of the regulation of MAX5 um, of the p-granule condensation uh, involves another component. Um, that is the RNA that is part of the, of the condensates, as, as I mentioned earlier. And we've recently shown that the regulation of phase separation of the p-granule uh, by the concentration gradient of the protein MAX5 happens via a competition for RNA binding. So both 
MAX5 and the p-granule components tend to bind RNA and the p-granule components condense in the presence of RNA. Um, and at high concentration of MAX5, the RNA is already bound to MAX5 and not available for the PGL3 to form p-granules. So, so in the presence of MAX5, it would bind RNA and restrict the formation of, of the PGL3 droplets while in the absence of MAX5, they, they form because they can um, take up all the, all the RNA that is there. And as a result, effectively, um, MAX5 re regulates the phase separation um, of the peak kernel material, but via an extra component that is sort of not in visible in this simplified um, phase diagram. Now, it's also interesting to come back to the point that we have a sort of local equilibrium um, arguments and to build a system that is globally not at equilibrium. So we can um, look at droplet dynamics in such a gradient of concentration of a regulator, or which also implies that the um, emulsion has a spatial gradient of the supersaturation. Um, so we have an, here is a stochastic simulation of many droplets. We start out with a spatially homogeneous case uh, where we have the classical emulsion that would ripen. And then we introduce a gradient um, of assembly disassembly reflected in the fact that the solution is super saturated on the right side and under saturated on the left side because of this extra gradient. And this then gives rise to a somewhat unusual unconventional droplet dynamics and segregation of material to one side. Um, so that was one example of how um, phase separation physics um, plays a role in cellular processes. I now want to come to another example uh, to discuss phase separation physics um, in cells. And that is the idea that um, droplets that form can contribute to damping or buffering of variability and fluctuations of concentrations. And the idea essentially is that if we have um, um, components in a cell that condense into a droplet, then there is a there are two different coexisting co concentrations uh, set by equilibrium conditions at the interface. And if we now have variations of um, molecule number, let's say outside of the droplet, then rather than increasing the um, concentration outside, it will change the size of the droplet. So we can think of having cells which vary in total number of molecules, these, if these molecules now tend to form droplets, the result will be that the condensates will have varying size, but the concentrations um, um, are more similar because they are um, strongly influenced by the um, third thermodynamics of phase coexistence at the interface. So in the simplest case, um, we would just have fixed concentrations inside and outside, um, independent of the total number of molecules in a particular case. One can study that in, in simplified uh, mesoscopic models, and we can sort of start out with a situation where there's no droplet formation, and we consider concentration fluctuations that results from a balance of production and degradation of molecules. Classical picture would be an expression of a gene generating RNA and proteins, which are then both um, degraded. And since these are molecular, molecular stochastic processes, um, due to sort of this um, stochasticity of reactions, we get a noise of concentration. This concentration noise is characterized by a variance divided by the mean square. And if we have just Poissonian statistics from, from assembly disassembly, um, this noise decreases with the number of uh, molecules on average along this dashed line. Um, and if we have a situation of an experiment with cells, we typically have variability between different cells. So for example, one can think of that the rates of assembly and disassembly are not the same for all cells. And the result of that variability um, for large concentrations, this variability will dominate the uncertainties and the 
the curve will saturate to a um, constant noise level at high concentration due to cell to cell variability. Now, if we add to the situation um, now a droplet that the protein that is produced um, for condenses into a droplet and concentration fluctuations of this protein now give rise to size fluctuations of the droplet, concentration fluctuations will be reduced. And this, this is um, shown here. So if we take the overall number of molecules generated by assembly disassembly, this is the purple curve, which is the same properties as before. But if you're asking what is the concentration outside of the droplet, um, then as soon as the system starts to phase separate, and we have here take the phase separation fluctuations into account, then the noise drops and you can get closer to this Poissonian level that we had um, in the absence of variability between different cells. Now, if we do this in some more detail, um, we can look at time scales. And of course, the result depends on how fast assembly and disassembly of the molecules is as compared to the kinetics of the droplets. So if we change uh, the kinetics and have the protein turnover become fast, then we lose some of this um, buffering of the fluctuations. Sorry, so this uh, now... in the previous slide, I think, there was a question from Aritra. What does the slope represent? I think it was in this plot, if I... This slope here? I guess so. Yeah, so, I, so this slope is sort of a signature of Poissonian um, statistics. Well, while the saturation happens when the Poissonian statistic is no longer relevant. Okay. And here we come back to Poissonian statistics. Thank you. Um, now these ideas can also be tested um, experimentally. Um, so here in the lab of another, Tony Hyde. Another yeah. question, what are lambdas? So probably in your previous slide. The lambdas are the rate, these are chemical rates of production of molecules. The tors are rates of disassembly of molecules. And I don't go into the details of the equations here. This can be found in, in this paper. Okay. But this is a simple stochastic assembly disassembly process. Um, now I come to experiments. So here um, is an experiment of an artificial situation where a, a protein that is known to phase separate in buffer is expressed in cells that usually don't express this protein DDX4. But as it's sort of forced to express this protein, um, the protein forms condensates in the cell and they are shown here as these highlighted objects. And of course they grow in time as more and more of the material is produced in the cells. And this cannot be used to quantify um, concentrations um, inside these droplets and outside the droplets and to measure the quantities that we can calculate in our model, namely the concentration noise. And so we have here one set of data, uh, which is essentially representing the overall variability of molecule numbers, uh, which essentially relates to cell to cell variability. And the green is the noise um, of the concentration outside the droplets. And um, we find a characteristic behavior uh, that qualitatively corresponds to what we can calculate in our model in this solid green line. We get this reduction of the noise uh, due to the phase separation in the, in the, the right shape. And um, one can study this um, through cell divisions and through doing cell divisions, um, these droplets dissolve, which means um, that the noise can no longer be buffered um, during the process when droplets dissolve and we have this higher, higher noise during division and smaller noise before and after as a sort of as direct um, test of the idea that um, the dissolution of these droplets would give rise to higher variability of concentrations. So um, next theme um, I want to discuss is the uh, point that condensates are 
uh, meant to localize and position chemistry and biochemistry in cells and that typically there are chemical processes taking place in such condensates. And this gives rise to the, to the physics of droplets which carry um, chemical processes. So chemical reactions taking place in droplets. And one can distinguish here sort of two different types of situations. Um, one is the case where the droplet just provides um, an environment in which the chemical reaction takes place, but the droplet material itself is not involved in the reaction. So for example, you can imagine molecules um, that are attracted by the droplet are, are um, entering it at higher concentrations than outside and then encountering each other specifically inside the droplet. So therefore reactions can be localized, reactants can be concentrated and thereby reaction can be accelerated and positioned using a droplet. And the other situation is that the droplet material itself is part of chemical reactions and um, sort of it's turned over by reactions. So it could be generated inside the droplet um, in sort of an autocatalytic type of way or, or it may um, be disassembled inside the droplet. So many different reaction scenarios are possible, but then we have droplets that turn over or, or are, are driven by, by reactions. And this is what I call chemically active droplets. And there are some interesting novel droplet behaviors that one would find here. And I will in the following focus on this second case. So in, if we want to discuss such active droplets, um, the simplest case would be a two component system which can phase separate Let's if phase A and B. And now I'm taking the, the situation where I can have a, a reaction that allows to transition from A to B and back from B to A. Um, if I want to describe this now in physical terms, in addition to the sort of thermodynamics at the interface, I now have to take into account diffusion and reaction. So I can describe this by reaction diffusion equations, both inside and outside of the droplet. And in the simplest case, these chemical reactions have to obey a detailed balance condition. Um, so the forward and backward rate is then related to the free energy change of the reaction. And one can show that in this sort of what I call passive case, um, we have a quite simple, but also a bit boring situation that quite generally, this would lead to droplets dissolving because one can then always minimize the free energy of the system um, by um, sort of going out of the coexistence region. So um, passive droplets where detailed balance um, is obeyed of these individual reactions uh, typically don't survive. However, it gets more interesting when we break detailed balance. And this can be done by providing a fuel that um, these reactions somehow um, need an extra component which provides extra um, energy to, to drive the reaction. An example would be a, a protein being phosphorylated you know, or dephosphorylated. These are uh, reactions that require um, chemical energy or ATP, for example, to, to happen, uh, at least in one direction. And that this then corresponds to a scheme where a third fuel component somehow drives a reaction from A to B. And in this case, it, uh, the detailed balance of the reaction A to B alone is, is broken. Um, and we have a non-equilibrium situation. And um, in such a case, a number of new things can happen. In particular, we find that droplets may not dissolve. They can be steady state droplets. And in fact, these can have a finite, well-defined size. They usually, as I've shown you before, droplets tend to, by emulsions tend to ripen, droplets become larger and larger and there are fewer and fewer of them. In the active case, we can maintain their size. They would not ripen. And this corresponds to a situation where there's a stable radius so that the, the rate of growth of the droplets typically depends on the radius of the droplet. And if there's a stable radius, um, then we have a situation where no ripening occurs. In the case of, of passive droplets without chemical reactions, um, such a stable radius doesn't exist. And I'm showing you an example here to compare the passive the case shown before without chemical reactions to a case of chemically active droplets. So in the case without reaction, we have the Oswald ripening described before and with, with 
um, reactions, we can have a situation where such ripening stops and droplets have a preferred size and a steady state with many droplets of fixed size. Now, um, I want to sort of move one step further and um, first um, point out that um, cells um, have many different examples of RNA protein assemblies and that very different types of cells all have them. And these, these are sort of very elementary and, and ancient structures, which raises the point that these are evolutionary very, very old. And um, this links us or links this field also to the question of what was the um, relevance of such condensated structures in very early cells or even at, at the origin of life. Um, and it was an old idea by Operin and also by Haldane that um, phase separation in particular coacervation where um, macromolecules aggregate to form colloidal droplets in a liquid phase could have played an important role to organize chemistry in complex ways um, when life first emerged. And based on this idea, we are also using our active droplet models um, sort of as simple models for uh, primitive cell-like structures. So you can think of them as prebiotic protocells that um, have many features of, of real cells, but are much simpler and, and could, could be precursors in principle, or could be simple models for early cells. And now having active droplets that turn over and that have well-defined size are very nice models for such um, protocells. So let's think of an active droplet as a protocell, as I mentioned before, in order to give it a finite size and well-defined de size, um, we need chemical reactions and have the material turn over. So we have to couple it, the, the chemistry to an outside energy source. And then we can maintain droplets uh, out of equilibrium as stable stationary object of finite size. Um, now I can think of this ongoing chemical reaction and turnover um, as something like a primitive metabolism um, of this type of primitive cell. Now, if we want to think of this as primitive cells, then it would be nice if we could um, also have them multiply and, and, and divide, not just have them stationary. And the interesting uh, feature of our simple um, um, active droplet model is that it can actually uh, give rise to divisions. And uh, this is because of the non-equilibrium nature that can be shape instabilities um, in such droplets if the chemical um, driving and the turnover of material exceeds a certain uh, threshold. And here you see an example of a sequence of shapes because starting from a slightly perturbed spherical shape um, in this simple model. And I here I show you a solution to a kahn hilliard equation with chemical reactions um, where detail balance is broken to maintain the system out of equilibrium. Um, this system has a preferred size, but the sh spherical shape at that size can become unstable. And then the droplet starts to stretch and splits in two. So we now have a system that is that is turning over its material has a well-defined size it localizes chemical process and it can divide and we can draw a state diagram of the system essentially there are two important reactions that drop the material can um, turn over to b can turn over to a a tends to leave the droplet we need a reaction from a to b outside to maintain the system in steady state this is a, a reaction which requires an energy input and then b can again drive growth of the droplet and in, in, in the steady state balance, everything stays at constant size. And if we now change the rates from B to A or from A to B, we can have different situations. Um, if the B to A rate, it gets very large, then droplets tend to dissolve. If we um, have a certain range of rates in this blue region, spherical droplets are stable and stationary and have a well-defined size. And if we now increase the a to B rate, um, 
essentially just put it outside. Then there is a, when we cross this line, there's a shape instability in droplet split. So if we draw the dynamics of such a droplet um, as a function, sort of the droplet raises as a function of the reaction rate, uh, there is a branch of um, uh, stationary sizes. So if the droplets are larger, they tend to shrink. If they're smaller, they tend to grow. If we have a weaker reaction rate, they would all disappear, disassemble. And now it turns out that there can be a critical rate beyond which the spherical shape is unstable. Now, when the droplet divides, it splits into two smaller droplets, which then tend to grow again. They first approach the spherical shape and then they may get unstable again. So we can get cycles of growth and division of these droplets. And now in the same model, I show you this here, a solution to the dynamic equation of phase separation plus chemical reactions. We start from a droplet becomes unstable, it splits. And here there are a few cycles which show that uh, droplets that result from division are smaller. They first tend to grow until they become unstable and split again. So we have um, sort of a simple model for something that looks like a protocell, primitive cell-like structure. It has a simple type of metabolism, which is the turnover of material. There are cycles of divisions and growth. It has to be maintained far from equilibrium to, to survive and to be maintained. There's no need for any membranes. So everything can be done with droplet interfaces. And of course, this is not yet anything that would be a real cell because there is no um, diversity and there's no genetics, but it provides a physical basis to build on it and to build cell-like structures. Okay, so um, I'm through, through most parts of my talk. Um, I've discussed phase separation in cells, condensation of proteins, and finally active droplets, and have shown you that these um, sort of very ancient condensates of proteins and RNA in cells have features that could have uh, played a role when, when life first uh, formed in the organization of chemistry in cell-like structures. And in the last minutes of this talk, I want to come back to the um, material that is formed when proteins condense in liquid-like phases and ask the question, what type of complex material and complex fluid is this? What do we know about it? Um, and I want to highlight in particular one observation that is often um, seen when condensing proteins outside of cells in buffer solution. And what happens there is often that, is that they form liquid droplets, but which don't maintain their properties. These liquids seem to change their material properties and harden. That's a term that's often used, but I will show you that it's very not an accurate term. But here in this movie, you see an example. We have an emulsion, droplets fuse, they fluctuate. But if one observes this over a number of minutes, uh, the dynamics slows down, the fusion events stop, the fluctuations become, become weaker, and the system does not look as fluid as before. Now, there are other ways to observe this, this phenomenon. Um, for example, by bleaching the fluorescence intensity with a, with a laser, one can see the dynamics of molecules by the recovery of fluorescence. For example, here there was bleaching and there's a quick recovery over um, just a few minutes. If we do this just quickly after the preparation of the droplets in the test tube, if we let the material um, stay for a while, let's say here 46 hours, and we bleach then, the recovery is very, very slow. And that corresponds to this red curve here. So the dynamics of molecules has changed. A similar phenomenon happens when we observe beads that are put inside this liquid. Um, and one observes the dynamics by looking at the diffusion of the beads. So at early times, we have a certain type of diffusive motion of beads inside a droplet. If we look at the same situation later, 
in this case, 31 hours, the diffusion is reduced, the jet directories are much more localized. And this raises the question of what does this tell us about material properties and what is happening um, in these condensates? Um, of course, there's also the question of, is this relevant to biology? And one could speculate that in cells, there may be reasons to prevent this slowing and hardening from happening, but there could also be reasons to make use of it. Um, and that's something that will be interesting in the future to address more. Yeah. So now we can directly study material properties of these condensates by deforming droplets and measuring the forces needed for these deformations. And um, this can be done, um, this particular Elisabeth Friedrich and Luis Javert in Dresden are doing this by attaching beads to droplets and then using laser traps to deform the droplets. So you see such an experiment. These are two beads and using the laser trap, um, one can now deform the shape of the droplet, in this case periodically, and measure the time dependent force that is required for these deformations. And this can be used not only to measure surface tensions, but also viscosity, elastic moduli, or more general, the rheology of the material, the frequency dependent moduli, by varying the frequency of the um, movements of the beads. Now, when doing that, one first gets information about the surface tension because the main mechanics of the, the droplets um, is governed by surface tension because that's what drives this object back to its spherical shape. And from these measurements, when, when we find a surface tension of a few micronewtons per meter, which is completely consistent with the estimate I showed you earlier, based on the time it takes for droplets in the cell to fuse. So these droplets seem to have a very similar surface tension than those inside the cell, but here we have a more uh, precise measurement. And this is a tiny surface tension, just to highlight that, five micronewtons per meter is much, much smaller, for example, than air-water surface tension, which is, which is uh, orders of magnitude larger. So the, these are droplets with a very, very low surface tension. Now, if we have this time-dependent deformation of the droplet, we get, as a result, a time-dependent force that is acting on the beads to exert this um, deformation. And from the relation between force and displacement, we can um, infer moduli of the material. And from the phase shift between the two periodic curves, um, we can get the, comp the, the complex structures or the, the real and imaginary parts, the in-phase and outer phase um, responses correspond to elastic and viscous uh, material properties. And here I show you now the uh, complex modules of the material as a function of frequency for such droplets. And um, the, um, the real and imaginary parts are shown here as uh, se separately as two different curves as open and closed triangles. And this can be counted for by a very, very simple model for viscoelastic materials, the so-called Maxwell model, which is characterized by a single elastic modulus and by a single relaxation time. So the gray curves correspond to the Maxwell model. So we can infer here a relaxation time and an elastic modulus from the plateau where we reach. We have a very, very soft material with only 20 Pascal elastic modulus. And in this case, a relaxation time, the two together, they define the viscosity of the material. Now at early times, the relaxation time is short. If we look at this material after late after preparation, something very interesting happens. We see that the rheology curves look the same, but everything is only shifted in time. The elastic module is unchanged, but the relaxation time is slower. So this material over time remains viscoelastic with exactly the same liquid-like or viscoelastic properties and the same plateau elastic modulus, but it systematically slows down in time. And therefore we can superimpose these rheology curves measured at different times on a sort of master curve by just rescaling moduli and frequencies. And the system has at all times the same types of material properties, but the relaxation time increases dramatically with age. And 
this is sort of very characteristic for glass-like behaviors, which ages um, as one um, waits and um, shows that this is a very complex dynamics inside this material. And it's not a simple liquid as sort of the droplet-like fusion events suggest. So the system at all times is a viscoelastic fluid. It slows down. This is not a gelation process, which would give rise to a higher elastic modulus. So in that sense, it doesn't get harder. It slows down the cross-link lifetimes of this meshwork of this leading to a viscoelastic material somehow become longer, but the density of cross-links is unchanged. This is sort of a simple picture of how, it, how to think about this material. And so in contrast to a gelation process where one would somehow suddenly at, at some percolation threshold become a solid. And as the number of cross links is increased, the elastic modulus would increase. We have a situation where the elastic modulus is constant, but some of the viscosity increases as the material ages. And we think that this is related to a increase in cross link lifetimes of the interacting proteins. And this is likely related to polymeric disorder in the system. So many of the proteins that form these liquid-like phases um, do not fold in well-defined structures, but have, have, have so-called disordered protein domains, which and do not have well-defined structures, which are probably more polymer-like and there are many configurations. And so they can also interact in many different configurations. And we therefore think that the numbers of possible configurations when molecules interact um, gives rise to disorder that, and complex energy landscapes that can give rise to this glassy behavior. So with that, um, I'd like to wrap up. So I've given you an overview of the physics of phase separation in cells and their role for um, cell biology. Um, I've shown that phase separation in cell cytoplasm can account for the formation of condensates, um, that P granules are liquid-like structures that form by condensation of proteins and RNA as an example of many other similar structures in cells. And they are segregated by position dependent phase separation um, in a non-equilibrium setting. I've discussed the possibility of concentration buffering using phase separation. Um, I've discussed active droplets with the simple model for what we think of as a simple protocell type model that can grow and divide. Um, and I've highlighted the fact that these are, uh, these condensates are very complex soft materials and we have to, we are in the very early stage to understand how the interactions of molecule components give rise to phase separation and give rise to their material properties. I've shown you evidence for glass-like um, aging kinetics and it will be an interesting question to understand how cells either prevent this aging um, or maybe make even make use of it. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, so if you have questions, please uh, raise hands. I have already one question from Debashish, please. Uh, uh, okay, Frank, uh, uh, very nice talk, first of all. Uh, I have uh, some question about uh, the you know, first part. Uh, so is there any study of the growth law of the droplets? When they grow, uh, is uh, something like Lipschitz's laws of law or you know, some other power law, is it known in these cases? So it is difficult to measure in cells. Um, we have studied the size distribution and dynamics in the, the model where we segregate droplets in a gradient. And there we find sort of a extension or generalization of the Lifshitz loss of type of arguments and behaviors. But that's so far a theory work and I haven't seen the proper measurements of that because um, the fluctuations are difficult to deal with and the, the quantification is very difficult in a cell. Okay. And of course, if you do it in simple settings outside of cells, then you see the classical behaviors. Yeah. Okay.
the other, another related question is that in the liquid liquid phase separation, uh, closer to the center of this coexistence region, you have also bicontinuous structure. Now here, that situation probably never arises because you have only droplet morphology. Um, so with, with bicontinuous, you probably refer to spinodal decomposition type of right, right. Uh, phase separation. Right. Um, of course, at the end, it will it will also segregate in coexisting phases that settle in some equilibrium state. And in our situation, um, we are typically in a, in a case where the volume taken up by these droplets is very small as compared to the total volume, so that in the most scenarios, you are far from this spinodal decomposition regime. And what we've seen so far was sort of nucleation type of kinetics. Um, and, but, but of course, in general, you could, you could expect also to find other regimes. But for spinodal decomposition, typically you need a um, high fraction of um, volume occupied by these structures. And the volume fractions have to be probably comparable. Here, probably yeah. there is a big difference. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Another question uh, by Vijay. Hi, hi, Frank. This is Vijay. Uh, hi, Vijay. Hi. Uh, I had two questions. Uh, so one is about the active droplets uh, model. So if you think of simple uh, reaction diffusion processes like the Gray Scott model, that has all certain parameter regimes where you actually get droplet uh, divisions that uh, that very much look like cell division processes. How how different is that from the one that you showed in the protocells picture? Um, I don't know how. I would have to look into this to understand how different it is. Already the question of how similar are droplets in, in a reaction diffusion setting and a, in a setting based on thermodynamics. I guess I guess you find phenomenologically similar things and how to compare them and how do, whether they fit under under a common umbrella, I, I don't I don't know. But of course um, you can move if you add chemical reactions to droplets, you get more features of reaction diffusion systems in them. And if you, you can also try to bring reaction diffusion systems um, where you form patterns closer to droplet-like structures. But of course, in reaction diffusion systems, you have fixed length scales. While usually in simple phase separation, you will coarsen. Right. But as I showed, as the moment you add reactions, you also use length scales, and then maybe the systems look more similar to each other. But I haven't done this comparison. It's yeah, difficult to get, I should say, it's difficult to get sharp interfaces with reaction diffusion systems. Correct, that's correct. That's you, have correct. To, you have to push parameters very hard. That's correct, that's correct. Uh, the second question I had was what about the last part of the hardening that you showed? I mean, the time scales were a bit puzzling. So you showed mostly, I think, in vitro examples with like 46 hours. Where will you ever find this in cells? What sense will divide by then, right? Yeah, but still, um, it, um, it's true. If, if you if things turn over, then you can prevent this from happening. Um, but of course, if you, for example, f form in a, would form in a cell assemblies that are um, not dynamic anymore, mm -hmm. then the cell may not be able to turn them over anymore. They may be, for example, become um, um, problematic. Yeah, um, pathological assemblies of cells are known in many diseases. Pathological assemblies of molecules are known in many diseases. So, so um, if this hardening occurs, it could become pathological, and the cell has to prevent it from happening. Um, and one way to prevent it from happening could, for example, be active processes yeah, that that um, prevent things from from locking into into certain configurations. But this is all not yet explored, and, and we're just at the beginning of this. And of course, you could also think of building structures that you. Um, where you can use material properties that are more solid-like, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and of, and maybe with this um, process of materials that behave more like solids but are ex actually aging fluids, it could be also be easier to 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 dissolve them again yeah? mm -hmm. than if you build a real gel that is covalently cross-linked. Mm -hmm. So I think there are many many um, arguments in favor of for cells may, may benefit from this type of physics, but also um, possibilities that it can be pathological and it will be important to understand this. Okay, thanks. So we now have a question in the chat by Mariam. What happens if you consider the droplet compressible 
what is the effect of second viscosity, I mean inactive droplet? So clearly the, the material properties inside and outside the droplet can be different. Um, so therefore the viscosity of the liquid can be different inside and outside. Now in a cellular setting, the density of protein inside and outside droplet is not so different. It's just composition, which is different. And therefore we don't expect the viscosity to be very different inside and outside. So in a, in a cellular setting, you would rather think you have a liquid with very different composition in the droplet and outside the droplet, but maybe um, in particular the viscosity um, and also the density are not so different. So the question is more raised in the case when you really have a very different uh, type of fluid inside and outside, for example, in buffer solution, it will be interesting to discuss the role of two viscosities. I cannot give a simple answer to what the consequences will be. Do we have other questions? I have some, but uh, I don't know. Ah, another question from Ashif. I am a bit confused about fusion versus division. What drives those events? So fusion happens in classical droplets where surface tension um, implies that the free energy can be lowered when the surface energy, a surface area is reduced. And when two droplets meet um, at constant volume, I can reduce the area of the surface by making them spherical. And therefore the system will be driven towards a sphere. And that's why two droplets become one. And that's driven by surface tension. Um, droplet division doesn't happen in this passive case, where the system moves towards equilibrium, it only happens when the system is maintained away from equilibrium. In my example, by having chemical reactions uh, that are driven by some external energy supply via fuel. And then the division comes from a shape instability. So the chemical reactions then now can perform chemical work that can work to increase the surface area um, and th there's work needs to do that because of surface tension. So the surface tension still prefers a sphere, but the chemical reactions now can drive the system away from the spherical shape. And the energy input of the chemical reaction perform work that it can increase the surface area. And then the, dro the droplet can deform and split. So that's clearly an active process. Uh -huh. Not moving towards some thermodynamic equilibrium. Can I ask uh, one related question? Uh, this was uh, uh, related to the last part of the talk where you have the protocell type of thing. So uh, according to Schrodinger's original, what is life? Uh, so it must have metabolism and it must have replication, which both of them are there in this scenario, except one thing. And that is, that there is no way of you know, propagating information because there is no information carrying molecule. So in order that it can be called a protocell, uh, I guess there should be some molecule which will carry information from one cell to the daughter cells, right? I mean, what is your comment on that? I mean, in order to qualify as protocell, isn't that necessary also? Yeah, that's why the, you have the adjective proto. I think for a cell it's necessary. For a protocell it's not yet necessary, but, but um, that's just the terminology. Um, of course, if you have droplets formed by complex polymers, let's think of the components that form the droplet as, as polymers, um, and if these polymers have subunits that are not all the same, then of course the, the moment you have these polymers can have um, sort of different compositions or different sequences, um, you can get variability. Uh, so in, in the model I'm, I'm presenting, I just have components A and B, but these components can be complex themselves. Yeah? And then if you add uh, um, on top of my, my, my model, the fact that reactions may modify these polymers and they're not all identical, one could add such an information carrying components. In principle, you don't need an extra component. You could take the ones that form the droplets themselves. Yes, but then you need machinery which will extract information in the next generation also, right? From those molecules. I don't know. Um, because that's, that's an interesting question. But in principle, if you have um, replication that is imperfect, um, that may be enough yeah? because you have your variability and replication and then um, you get selection 
as an emergent phenomenon. Yeah. Now, my question was that if it is some sequence, it's some heteropolymer which has sequence, yeah. not in that, that sequence with some defect in replication. So some polymerase mm -hmm. kind of thing should be there. Otherwise, the, the, the information- Yes, I, I guess in, in a model, you have to add more degrees of freedom. But, but in, in principle, you can do it with the fact that um, you, you polymerize some polymers that can stochastically vary their exact composition. Yeah. And they can have this kind of rebuild of the same subunits, but arranged in different ways. I'm not, not saying that this answers all your questions. I'm just saying you don't need an extra molecule. You can do it with the ones that phase separate in principle. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, I was wondering about the link with transport. I don't know if your granules are sometimes transported, but sometimes we have liquid droplets which are transported. And I was wondering if they are too liquid, how, how can mortars pull on it or could we imagine that they have to age to be more solid-like so that it can be transported and pulled somewhere? Um, yeah, in principle, I think the droplets could be pulled on by just um, having anchors sort of in the, as I showed also with the beads, yeah, that we can use beads to pull on the droplets by, by coating beads with something that has an affinity to the droplet. And often beads will do that spontaneously. They just um, um, attach to the droplets. So, so things that have an affinity to the droplet can be used to pull on the droplet, even if it's liquid. Um, now the droplets, of course, in, in cells, they are of course also carried by flows. That's one way to also transport them. Um, I, I would expect there should be examples where they're actually carried by motors, but I don't have an example right, right away to, to point to. Mm -hmm. We have a question by Prabal. Hi, uh, this is Prabal here. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the early part of your phase separation. So you tried to say that using that uh, ATP producing around 10 kBT and with the length scale is a near equilibrium. So does this mean that this protein also show the same phase separation outside cellular environment if someone managed to do that experiment? So I showed you examples where the proteins phase separate outside. Um, so when, when you do it in, in, in physiological buffer, they phase separate outside of the cell. And what is the driving force there? Is the same mechanism? Um, we, we think that this phase separation is governed by interactions between parts of the protein. And if, if you have attractive interactions, then you would have a single component phase separate um, in buffer solution um, we don't know exactly the, the nature of the interactions. We know they are salt dependent, so they are, have elect electrostatic components. Um, otherwise, it's not easy to characterize um, so in the these interactions in particular detail. In the cellular environment, when you have this phase separated state, I mean, if we look at the uh, their uh, so called equation of state, I mean, uh, the same like they are. Uh, density, even though they are in liquid like, but the density or pressure, they will be similar as in the outside the cellular environment when they do the phase separation. I mean, are the equilibrium analog in both cases or something different? Um, it's if you do this in buffer solution, then you get a protein dense phase coexisting with a protein yeah. um, dilute phase. In the cell, you have two protein-rich phases coexisting. In that sense, they're not the same. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you do it in the buffer solution, you therefore see the, the, the droplet sediment because they have a higher mass density as the um, solution out, outside. If you do that with, if you have a coexistence of two protein-rich phases, uh, gravity would play a lesser role. But this depends on now on how water is partitioned into the two phases. We don't know very much about this. I see. Um, so I don't know how different the concentrations are inside the cell and in, in, in vitro conditions outside the cell and buffer. But to, so as far as we can tell right now, so far, they are not so different. They're similar. So it's, it's, um, and another related question, what was asking this, uh, what is your definition of cell when this, like uh, there are various cases where droplet can grow and divide depending 
So, so what is exactly uh, this uh, analogy of cell? What cell property you are attaching to this uh, when you say these are like uh, prototype of uh, the uh, kind of cell-like, correct? So what exactly cell-like property do I have in this model of this? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a structure um, which has a well-defined shape and size. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's made of liquid. Um, it is a chemical compartment distinct from the outside. It, turn, it takes up material from the outside. It releases material to the outside. It turns over um, and it can divide. And these are the properties. And it's, it is a non-equilibrium. So it, it, it can only exist if it's maintained out of equilibrium using um, um, <clears throat> yeah, by, by maintaining the system with an extra energy input outside of equilibrium. So of course, um, it's an active droplet, and I, I, I'm saying I can use it as a model for a protocell, as a simple model for a protocell. Okay. Thanks. And I'll have a question in the chat from Jan. Do the droplets form via homogeneous uh, nucleation? That's an interesting question of how nucleation happens, and I think this depends a lot on the on the condensate that we're dealing with. So um, the P granules seem to be um, nucleated uh, very easily and very quickly. So they seem, um, still I don't think, but we don't know that this is homogeneous nucleation. Of course, in the cell, there are lots of components and there are lots of um, structures that might serve as nucleators. And I would expect that in the case of the P granules where they nucleate easily, there is just many potential nucleators around or potential nucleation sites. And then there are other structures which have where the nucleation has to be controlled very, very carefully. And then there is only a small number of sort of nucleators available. And an, an example, an extreme example are so-called centrosomes, which I didn't talk about in my talk, but where each cell has exactly two and they're also droplet-like objects that form. And there are very specific nucleators and the nucleation is tightly controlled. So I think that the, cases where nucleation is very tightly controlled and cases where it's very free to occur, I suspect that it always works um, by nucleation on some sort of heterogeneous nucleation on some nucleator um, uh, structures or some seeds which promote nucleation. But we don't know that yet. Another question uh, from Mintu. When you talk about phase separation in the cell cytoplasm, I think I've missed the parameters by which you have defined the phase separation. Can you please repeat? So in the case of phase separation, we have a coexistence of at least two phases that have different composition and um, coexist at same chemical potentials, same pressures um, across an, a sharp interface. You know? And I guess um, this was then discussed within a phase diagram where one axis is the composition axis, another axis would be a temperature axis, and one can find regions where this coexistence occurs and other regions where everything is well mixed. So that would be one, one thing would be the definition, the other thing would be how to characterize it you know, in a phase diagram. Okay, I have another question. Uh, in your talk, so you were mentioning that for P granules to be localized. Uh, you have this mechanism involving uh, MEX5, if I remember, that binds to RNA. Uh, in a cell, you may have several types of granules, and so the need to localize differently several species. Do we have an idea of other systems, uh, other competition effects that would allow multiple localization in the cell? Yeah. Um, of course, one um, alternative positioning effect is transport, yeah, that we mentioned before, that you can use motors or flows to transport. Um, we haven't studied other phenomena, so we don't know where and when they occur. But of course, we would expect there to be a whole set of uh, phenomena that contribute to pos positioning and localization of these, these structures. Mm. Um, of course, some of them are localized inside the nucleus, which then has to do with how molecules are distributed inside and outside the nucle cell nucleus. Um, 
and their transport, of course, is, is key. So it will be a combination of, of transport processes and the, the concentration gradients. Of course, there could, could also be several gradients to do that do different things. But uh, I think gradients are the more exotic um, version of positioning and the more typical one is, is, is transport. And could we imagine that there would be a coupling also between transport and these chemical reactions that you mentioned inside the droplets? Because if you move, then you have you can have a region where uh, species uh, B is not consumed yet, and then you can uh, have uh, uh, always uh, explore a new region. It's in the spirit of having finding some new nutrients that have not been uh, consumed yet. Mm. But maybe the scales are not the good ones, I don't know. Yeah, but I think these are very interesting questions. Um, the moment one combines this all with transport um, gives them that next level of complexity to, to what I've been discussing. And of course, in the cell, one can expect to find a combination of, of, of these different degrees of complexity. But um, yeah, so I started with phase separation, added chemical reactions. I think it's natural to add transport and this opens the door to phenomena that so far I haven't discussed. Yeah, so many fascinating questions hmm. about it. We have time for one last question, one or two questions still. Yeah, if... I, I, have a, I have a question, if you allow yeah. me. Okay. Yes, sure. uh, Frank, you said that the surface tension is actually much lower. I don't hear you anymore. Uh, we don't hear you, Debashish. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. now we can hear you. Uh, my question is that the surface tension that you quoted was quite low, right? Yes, uh, compared so, to water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, compared to water. So what could be the biological implications or is cell exploiting that low surface tension in some manner? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't have a good answer to that. Um, this is sort of makes it easier or harder for the cell to do certain things. I don't know. Um, I would expect that, you know, then it's it easier, of course, to have non-spherical structures. Right. Yeah. So on is the that, other hand, yeah. Is that advantageous for certain processes? That That's the my main question. Yeah, maybe it's easier to build some, some more complex structures that don't look like droplets. Yeah? Um, and to combine on the other hand, um, yeah, the question is also, if you have surface tension, you can also use it. Let's say you're having capillary forces to do things. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess whether it's good or bad, I have no idea, but uh, it's certainly important to understand what is, the, um, what is the value of the surface tension and it allows for different scenarios. But I, it's an interesting question. I don't have an answer actually. Okay, thank you. We have a question. Uh, by uh, Saroj. Uh, is there any correlation between the aging dynamics and the multivalency of the proteins? So um, I don't know if there's a relation. I also don't know really how to investigate or how to determine the multivalency. I said, so the basic idea is that with multi multivalency is that you have proteins which can bind to more than one binding partner, and then you can form sort of meshworks. Um, and if they're, they're dynamic, they maybe appear like a fluid phase that phase separates from, from the rest. Um, but if you have only, um, if every molecule only binds to one other um, molecule, you would have dimers, which would not phase separate. So therefore multivalency can be a way to achieve um, the polymeric system. Um, uh, a fa phase, but then how it relates to the glass dynamics, we don't know yet. And of course, when, um, there could be a relationship, but, but it's unknown.
Okay, I think uh, we're about to finish this question session. So that's perfect timing. Uh, so thank you again uh, for this very nice talk.